Hello. Hello, everybody. Hi. Nice to see you back. Yep. Hey, Manga. How are you? Nice. How about? How good, about good, good, good. Uh, what happened? Did you? How, how did you fall out? I slip. Oh. You uh, thinking something else? One of, one of those very spiky seats from the tree. I think I, I mm. better chop it down. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay because, uh, you know, so last, uh, up to the, the last uh, Saturday, it is uh, June, so lunar calendar four. So yeah. that is not a good way. Hi, Albert. Believe it or not. Okay. Let's start. Okay. Albert, did you get my email? I haven't um, checked my email yet. Oh, no, no, no. Um, two yeah, weeks I, have, I, have, I have. Thank you. I, uh, I didn't hear from you, but I did offer to help in any way. Is there any way I can help? Oh, that's fine. I'm now fine. <laughs> Okay, can you see the screen? Excellent. Can you see my my screen? Yep. Okay, big history. Today yep. we will be on come on. Darwin evolution. Mm, good. Well, last time we talked about the origin of life and then after life you after life started, then life changed. And Darwin's evolution is about this change. It is the change in the inherited characteristics of biological populations over successive generations. So evolution is not about the origin of life. It is about how life uh, gradually changed from one, one form into the other form. So it is evolution rather than revolution. The main concept here is something called natural selection. A process inferred from three facts about the population. Number one, more offspring are produced than can possibly survive. So if there's uh, a cat, a pair of cats, then they will uh, give birth to more than two cats, hopefully, and then eventually uh, some will survive and some won't. Those which have, which is able to survive will be able to reproduce and therefore will bring that characteristics to the next generation. So traits vary among individuals, although um, catties, uh, kittens born from the same pair of parents, they are slightly different, all of them. So they are different um, survivals like some some may be fa running faster some may be um, more aggressive some may more tame etc so they will have different different traits and this and these differences are inheritable so you bring it from one generation to the other so that's three of the main main um, facts then when members of a population die they replaced by um, the point Pro progeny of parents better adopted to survive. So it's so-called the survival of the fittest. Now fittest here doesn't mean it, it might be the strongest. It just means it have survived and therefore it can reproduce. And therefore uh, this reproduction keep on selecting um, those uh, which favor um, survival. So it is the survival of the fittest. So the fittest here is not necessarily strongest. It might be the fattest, it might be uh, the slowest, whatever. Or it may have the best protection and some and so forth. So these are um, the main driving force of natural selection. 
Of course, we can also artificially select. For example, these are some pictures of pigeons. We know that uh, people have been keeping pigeons, and they by selecting their characteristics, we now have a very large variations of different shapes and colors and and uh, performance of pigeons. Albert, can I ask a question on the uh, survival of the fit? Or not a question, a comment. Um, it's very intriguing. Nature is incredibly flexible. Um, I once saw some statistics that um, during most eras, um, something like uh, 51 per uh, 52% of all children born, all male children born are women, um, are female. But during war, such as 1939 to 1945, there were more men. Uh, in those days, of course, it was only men who fought on the front line. So nature is providing or making up for those who are killed on the front lines. Yeah, um, um, kind of. I will come to that a bit later on. Let's continue. Oh, first. I beg your pardon. Sorry. No problem. No problem. I just Sorry, okay. I Let me continue with this uh, artificial selection here. So, um, for example, we have dogs. Dogs is another uh, characteristics. They are all wolves, but um, they have been selected to have different looks and sizes and so forth. And uh, in terms of plants, the original wheat have only a few seeds, but now after a thousand years of selections, their seeds is much larger and much more abundant, and is almost is also easier to keep, etc. So there are um, we are selecting a certain plant for its own characteristics. One of the most um, dramatic examples is this a fox. So I think this is a movie. Let me show it first. The experiment was begun in the 1950s at a fox farm in Siberia. The foxes were being bred for their fur, but they were wild animals that were hard to handle and often too stressed to breed. Dmitry Belayev, a geneticist, was taken on to see if he could develop foxes that would be easier to keep. He began his experiment by breeding together those foxes with the least excitable temperaments. Belayev selected foxes by a simple method. He extended a gloved hand into each animal's cage. The foxes that attacked, cowered or bit him, were excluded from breeding. But those that showed tolerance or curiosity were mated together. In effect, Belayev was selecting the foxes for their flight distance. The subsequent results were staggering. The new generations of foxes were transformed, not just in behavior, but in their appearance. Within just 10 years, the selected foxes showed new variety in their color. Some were born with mottled coats or black and white patches. Their ears became floppy. They started to bark, vocalize. They became highly playful even into adulthood and were no longer afraid of people. Some of the foxes even began to answer to their names. Belayev had stumbled across the discovery that selecting for the quality of tameness alone could set off a cascade of other changes. We can still see evidence of this quantum leap at the same research center today.
So the the process is selecting for tameness and against aggression. So this will result in some hormonal and neurochemical changes, and this also ultimately changes biology. So these hormonal and chemical changes could then be implicated in autonomy and anatomy and the physiology, and then it becomes more distinct. Like um, they are very much like dogs now. So you can now. Uh, buy fox to kids instead of buying wolf to kids. Of course, wolf is our dog. So the the actual process is from one month old to its sexual uh, maturity, um, which is about seven to eight months. They are tested for their tameness, and then uh, only those who are the tamest, twenty percent, is selected. So in about forty generation, they behave like dogs. Here's another example of one of those、um, pet fox now. Yes,、yeah, silly. Hello, winter foxy. Run, 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 run. Yeah, 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 boy, boy, yeah, 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 silly boy, yes, oh yeah. Yes. Yes, that's what the fox says. What the fox really says. Yeah. Yeah. Mhm. What you talk about? Yeah, what a baby! What a baby! Let me jump forward a little bit. Gotta brush your teeth, yeah. You don't tell me it actually looks like box. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Come on. Very quiet. So, can nature select? Oh yes, it's a matter of life and death. For example, the selection between a hunting animal versus its prey. So the faster the prey a prey can run, the less chance it will be caught. But at the same time, the faster a hunter can run, the better it can catch a prey. So this there is a competition in speed between them. So they are driving each other, running faster and faster. So the fastest、uh, animals are those which hunt by chasing. Uh, of course, not all animal hunt by chasing. Some animals hunt by other methods. For example, uh, dingoes or wolf, they hunt in packs. So they use another technique, but they also hunt. And、uh, in that case, they also hunt for different prey. So they they adapt to each other. So the hunter and the and the prey actually driving each other to run faster and faster. 
Another method is by camouflage. So here, um, all the pictures here have animals. The left one is a tiger. The middle one is a lizard. I don't know whether you can see the eye. The eye is somewhere here. And then on the right side, the two are uh, two different insects. One on top and the other, they look like just um, leaves, uh, yellow leaves, but they are insects. So by using camouflage, they can avoid being eaten. But in the case of tiger, they they can sneak behind their their uh, prey better by having a uh, skin similar to its environment. Uh, this are uh, not a flower, but it looks very much like flower. Uh, again, by uh, being uh, similar to something, they avoid its predators. There might be some other uh, birds interested in eating them. So in order to to avoid being eaten, so they looks like a flower. Yeah. Somebody is green and brown. Looks so much like a flower, isn't it? Yeah. These are some other uh, camouflage. 16 animals with incredible camouflage strategies. Number 16, owls. Owls are nocturnal animals, meaning that they are active at night and asleep during the day. Since many other animals are actively hunting during the day, the owl needs a way to defend itself against its daytime predators. This is where its camouflage technique comes in. Many owls, like the one shown in this image, rest in trees during the day, so it's most beneficial for them to be able to blend in with the trees they call home. Number 15, geckos. Because geckos are usually quite small in size, they naturally have many predators, snakes, birds, and other larger reptiles. Not only are geckos vulnerable to many large predators, but they are also nocturnal. They have the entire day to sleep and wait, hoping they can go undetected by their enemies. This is why the clever camouflage abilities of geckos are paramount to their survival. Geckos are known to change their color to mimic their environment at will, which is infinitely useful when they get the urge to rest in a new area. Number 14, Crab Spiders. Many species of spider, like the crab spider shown in this image, use camouflage as both a defense mechanism and as a stealthy way to sneak up on unsuspecting insects. Because spiders have a variety of predators, camouflage is one of the best ways to evade their foes. Furthermore, a spider will often blend in with the colors of a flower or a plant to get up close and personal to bees, ants, and other insects that think a trip to their local flower is a safe one. 
Number 13, camouflage loop caterpillar. Many caterpillar have a very common form of camouflage technique, which allows them to change color based on the leaf, flower, or plant they were born on. However, not all caterpillars have such a passive defense mechanism. The camouflage looper, like the one depicted in the image, will tear off bits of plants and flowers and attach them to silk fibers on their back. This gives them the ability to manipulate many different environments to their advantage instead of relying on the environments that they were born in. Number 12, Dead Leaf Butterfly. The Indian Leaf Butterfly, also known as the Dead Leaf Butterfly, has an adaptive camouflage ability that mimics dead leaves. The tops of its wings are just like any other butterflies, vibrant, colorful, and easily detected by predators. However, when it closes its wings, the colors fade into the dull, lifeless colors of a dried up leaf. This gives the butterfly the flexibility to travel to many terrains, since dead fallen leaves can be found scattered on the ground in almost any environment. Number 11, Granite Ghost Dragonfly. The granite ghost dragonfly, which is one of the many species of dragonfly that make use of camouflage, is peculiar in that it blends in with a variety of rocks and stones. It is found in many urban locations in India and can be spotted blending in with stone walls, cement sidewalks, and granite buildings. The granite ghost takes advantage of the abundance of insect prey found in urban areas, and its skills in the arts of camouflage allow it to maneuver through cities virtually undetected. Number 10, the Mimic Octopus. The Mimic Octopus is one of many underwater denizens capable of using camouflage to scrounge around the seafloor undetected. Although colorblind, these remarkable creatures have the ability to instantly change their color, texture, and shape of their body to imitate underwater objects and landscapes to fool predators. The Mimic Octopus can do this by analyzing the essential features of some object or terrain and rearranging their anatomy accordingly. Number 9. Scorpion Fish The scorpion fish, endemic to the Indian and South Pacific Oceans, is a species of predatory fish capable of camouflaging in with the coral reefs and seaweed fields, where they normally spend their days. The many tentacles and feathery fins protruding from the fish's body allow it to mimic coral reefs with remarkable accuracy. The scorpion fish is a territorial predator and will strike any chance it gets at an unsuspecting fish trespassing on its underwater domain. Number 8. Pygmy Seahorse The pygmy seahorse is a tiny and delicate creature, bright in colors and measuring less than an inch in length. Given their fragile nature, these diminutive creatures don't venture out much and usually spend their entire lives attached to a gorgonian sea fan, which is a type of coral. The pygmy seahorse latches onto the coral with its hooked tail and changes the color of its skin to match the vibrancy of the respective sea fan. It can camouflage in so well with its environment that even a trained scientist will have a hard time identifying this one. Number 7. Walking Stick Bug Phasmids, also known as stick bugs or walking sticks, are a species of stick insect that resemble twigs in appearance. Predators often have a tough time spotting them because they look like an appetizing twig dangling from a tree branch. Not only do walking sticks have a really cool camouflage strategy, but if a predator happens to get a hold of one, they can detach their body from the limbs. The lost appendages will grow back after a short time. Number 6. Leaf Litter Toad Leaf Litter Toads, like the one in this image, effectively camouflage with the fallen leaves on the ground. Much like a dead leaf butterfly already mentioned on this list, the Litter Toad makes use of forest leaves to blend in with its environment. Although these amphibians can grow quite large, up to 3 inches in length, they are incredibly difficult to distinguish from the fallen leaves on the forest floor. Because they are nocturnal, the Litter Frog must use its camouflage during the day to avoid being picked off by predators. Number 5. Dresser Crabs The dresser crab isn't born with an inherent biological camouflage system, so it must improvise. These crabs use bits of nearby coral and seaweed to attach hooks onto their shell, making it look like they have a taste for fashion. Some have even been known to adorn themselves with a cloth, linen and jewelry left over from the debris of a sunken ship. The dresser crab is without a doubt the most stylish creature under the sea. Number 4. The Orchid Mantis The Orchid Mantis is a species of praying mantis that beautifully uses the art of camouflage to mimic the colors and shapes of the orchid flowers. Not only are these mantises aesthetically pleasing, but they are deadly as well. Deadly, of course, not to humans, but to the bees, butterflies, and other insect pollinators who are deceived by the cunning trickery of the Orchid Mantis. An unwary insect that lands on the Orchid Mantis will meet its end in one quick lash of the predator's claws. 
Number three, leafy sea dragon. Sea dragons, which are closely related to seahorses, are a species of underwater fish with seaweed-like appendages and fins that resemble leafy plants. The leafy sea dragon is native to the waters off the coast of southern Australia and typically find their home near kelp-covered rocks and massive underwater seaweed fields. The leafy appendages and the fins protruding from their body don't serve much of a purpose other than camouflage, so don't expect these aquatic creatures to be anything like the aggressive, fire-breathing dragons of Nordic mythology. Number 2. Reef Stonefish Reef Stonefish, like the ones shown in this image, are well adapted to their environment and often use a specialized camouflage technique to blend in with underwater stones and coral reefs. These fish often resemble a crusty rock or a lump of coral in appearance and sport long dorsal fin spines capable of injecting large amounts of venom into their victims. People have been known to step on one of these creatures because they can't tell them apart from other objects found underwater and the poison injection they incur leaves them hospitalized and incapacitated. And now for number one. But first, be sure to subscribe for new videos every day. Number one, Willow Ptarmigan. The Willow Ptarmigan is a species of bird native to North America and they can normally be found in the frigid northern regions of Canada. This bird is unique in that it has the ability to turn completely white in the winter, making it difficult to spot in the snow. They often fly and burrow into small crevices and mounds in the snow, leaving no tracks behind for predators to follow. The term white as snow applies very accurately to this vibrant species of bird. Well, the major discovery of evolution is of course by Darwin. Uh, Darwin observed some of the fringes, a fringe in the in one of those uh, political islands. Each of these have a different kind of uh, beak the beak adapts to the food available on that particular island. So there are uh, some uh, for breaking nuts, some are picking seeds, some are eating insects and so forth. They are all uh, different, the peak. Another one is, um, one of the most interesting is peacock. Uh, why peacock had these very large clumsy tails and and why they evolved to have this uh it seems like oh this is not good for survival but actually um the selection is by the opposite sex in um the animal kingdom almost except human the prettier uh, gender is actually the male, it's not the female. A uh, female peahen, not peacock, peahen, is usually just white. But peacock, the, the male, usually has a very fancy tail because uh, this is how they attract the female. The uh, Explanation may be if a male is able to grow such a beautiful uh, tail, that means it is able to survive very well and therefore attracts the female in order to um, mate, in order to produce a better offspring. So by this sexual selection, peacock's tails become prettier e ever since. So the selection itself by fitness, sometimes can be by uh, sexual orientation of the mating pair. Why we say that uh, all uh, all life form have the same origin? So here is a good example. You look at the uh, embryos, then we will see that they are almost the same: fish, reptile, birds, and even human. Uh, we still have a little bit of tail, although the tail being useless has a uh, string to a very small size. But at the end, there are some uh, men or human still have a little tail, uh, but obviously not many because the, the tail is not useful anymore. And the reason that we have a slit uh, between our the, the mouth and the nose there is of this guilt. Uh, by now, our guilt is now 
uh, stick together, but because it what we were evolved from fish. Um, this is a depiction of uh, the evolution. So the idea is that the older uh, life forms will be buried deeper into the ground as the weathering occurs. For example, uh, there might be a volcano, a volcano uh, explosions causing a lot of ash, and the ash kills a lot of animals. And when the ash falls down, this animal body is being uh, covered by the ash. And then later on, other uh, weathering events might push it downwards. So in order to, un to understand the life form in the past, one way is to look deeper and deeper into the ground. The deeper it is, the older it is. Of course, with uh, tectonic movement, some of these uh, deep uh, grounds was pushed upward by tectonic, uh, tectonic mo uh, activities so that we can discover them. But these are uh, these uh, bodies will be fossilized by the uh, carbonates that is available in the in the water in the soil, and then it becomes uh, uh, fossils. This is a time frame of um, of the ge uh, geological time. Uh, we will deal with into it uh, later in more details. Uh, basically, uh, it was divided into certain certain eons. The of course the initial eons is the um, heavy bombardment period, and then eventually going into different timing timing parts. So we will go into this uh, geological. Uh, time scales a bit more and then when we talk about them we will look at some of the uh, typical uh, life form at different times in the past stated clearly presents what is the evidence for evolution the theory of biological evolution makes two very bold claims about living creatures First, all living things on Earth are related. They evolved from a common ancestor. Second, the evolution of living things is powered by natural processes, things which can be studied and understood. Mm -mm -mm. But is there really any evidence that these two claims are true? Yes. There are so many observable facts from so many different fields of study that the only way we can even begin to talk about them is to group them into categories or lines of evidence. To keep things simple, here we'll focus on evolution's first claim that all living things on Earth are related. We cannot tackle the entire tree of life at once. After all, there's an estimated 8.7 million species alive today. So instead, we'll focus most of our attention on one fairly small but fascinating branch of the evolutionary tree, cetaceans. This branch includes whales, dolphins, and porpoises. Biologists tell us that all these creatures are closely related and that the entire group evolved from an ancient four-legged land mammal. Instead of taking their word for it, let's look at the facts. We'll start by looking at a few from the field of comparative anatomy, the study of differences and similarities between living things. Whales live in water and from a distance, they sort of look like giant fish. A close inspection of their anatomy, however, tells us a very different story. Whales, just like land mammals, but unlike fish, have placentas and give live birth. They feed milk to their young. They are warm-blooded, which is extremely rare for a fish. And whales do not have gills. Instead, just like us, they breathe air with two fully developed lungs. Whales don't seem to have noses like mammals do. Instead, they breathe through blowholes coming out the tops of their heads. Some whales have two blowholes, which almost look like nostrils, but dolphins and porpoises only have one. Surprisingly, if you look at their skulls, you find that the blowhole splits into two nasal passages inside the head. Could it be that the blowhole is actually a highly modified mammal nose? It looks that way, 
but we'll need more evidence to be sure. Many whales have hair, just like land mammals. In this photograph, you can actually see the whiskers of this baby gray whale as he rests his chin on mama's back. Strangely, whales have arm, wrist, hand, and finger bones inside their front flippers. Here's a photo of these bones, the same bones that bats, hippos, and people have in their front appendages. One bone, two bones, wrist, hand, and finger bones. Modern whales do not have back legs, but they do have a strange pair of bones where the hind legs should be. Here's a picture of these bones from a bowhead whale. They almost look like shriveled hip, thigh, and shin bones. This one even has a ball and socket joint between the hip and thigh bone, just like the ball and socket joint in your own hip. Is this resemblance a mere coincidence, or are these real leg bones? Perhaps leftovers from the whale's evolutionary history. Before we draw any bold conclusions, let's see if a completely separate line of evidence will confirm our suspicions. Embryology is the study of how creatures develop before being born or hatching from an egg. Here we see a dolphin and a human embryo side by side at similar stages of development. Notice that they both have what look like arm buds and leg buds. In humans, the leg buds grow to become legs. In whales, they grow for a while but then stop, effectively fading away as the rest of the whale continues to grow. These are all photographs of a common dolphin at different stages of growth. Notice that early on, we see two nostril grooves on the front of the face, just like you'd expect in a puppy or a human. As the dolphin continues to grow, the nostrils migrate to the top of the head and fuse together, becoming the dolphin's blowhole. So far, we have multiple facts from two independent lines of study, comparative anatomy and embryology, that are both telling us the same story. The ancestors of whales were once four-legged land creatures. Will the fossil record act as a third witness, confirming this idea? These are two species of extinct basilosaurid whales. These animals are known from multiple well-preserved skeletons, and they appear to have lived side by side roughly 34 to 40 million years ago. In this photograph, we're looking down at the top of a basilosaurid skull. This is not a model or a cast. These are the actual bones which were pulled from the ground. Notice that the nasal opening is not on the top of the head like those of modern whales, and not at the end of the snout like those of land mammals. Instead, it's right in the middle. This is an intermediate species, exactly what evolution tells us we should find. At the back end of a basilosaurid's body, there are small yet fully developed hips, legs, ankle, feet, and toe bones. These legs are far too small for walking on land, but they may have been useful while mating or for scratching away parasites and itchy skin. <laughs> Evolutionary theory tells us that the further we go back in time, the harder it should be to distinguish whales from normal land mammals. Meet Myocetus. The hip bones of Myocetus seem sturdy enough to walk on land, but this animal is considered to be a whale for many reasons. Their skeletons have all been found among fossils of sea creatures, which tells us they lived in the ocean. Their short legs, combined with long, flat fingers and toes, suggest they were strong swimmers with webbed hands and feet. Here we see the bottom side of a Myocetus jaw and skull. Her teeth match those of the basilosaurid whales we saw earlier, and the unique structures of her middle ear bones match those of basilosaurid whales and modern whales. Myocetus appears to be a walking whale. Scientists have found the fossils of many ancient whale-like mammals and continue to find more. Together, these fossils blur the line between four-legged land mammals and fully aquatic modern whales, solidifying the idea that whales indeed evolved from land creatures. Now let's look at a fourth line of evidence, DNA. <laughs> DNA molecules contain chemical codes which act like recipes for living things. Without ever looking at bones, embryos, or anatomy, researchers can compare the DNA code of different living creatures to find out who is most closely related to who. 
Whale DNA has been compared to all kinds of other animals, fish, sea lions, you name it. And so far, the closest genetic match is to the pudgy, water-loving hippopotamus. This does not mean that whales evolved from hippos, but if this genetic finding is correct, whales and hippos both evolved from a common ancestor that lived roughly 54 million years ago. At first, the link between whales and hippos surprised researchers because whales are mainly carnivores. They eat things like fish and small crustaceans. Hippos, on the other hand, are mostly vegetarian. A closer look, however, reveals that hippos and whales actually share many strange features, some of which may have come from their common ancestor. Ancient walking whales have specially shaped ankle bones found only in hippos and the close relatives of hippos. Just like whales, hippos are known to give birth and even nurse their young underwater. They both have multi-chambered stomachs, which is common for herbivores, but is almost unheard of for meat-eating mammals. They are both missing a coat of fur. And here's a fun fact. Whales and hippos are among the only mammals on Earth that have internal testicles. So there you have it. Four independent lines of evidence all tell us the exact same story. Whales evolved from four-legged land mammals. But the history of whales is not the only evolutionary history that we've been able to work out. We know from fossils, DNA, embryology, and many other lines of evidence that bird wings are actually modified arms and claws. Birds evolved from dinosaur-like ancestors. We can also clearly see that bat wings evolved from five-fingered hands very similar to those of monkeys and shrews. We've found that humans share a fairly recent common ancestor with chimpanzees, hmm. <laughs> that mammals evolved from reptile-like creatures, those reptile-like creatures evolved from amphibian-like creatures, those amphibian-like creatures evolved from fish-like creatures, and fish, if you go back far enough, share a common ancestor with segmented worms. So to sum things up, thousands of observable facts from completely independent fields of study have come together to tell us the exact same story. All living things on Earth are related. I'm John Perry, and that's a basic overview of the evidence for evolution stated clearly. Well, of course, there are some things uh, Darwin doesn't know or didn't know um, at biogenesis, how life started from non-living matter into living matter. That is something we dealt with the last two times. Another is at that time, they don't know about the DNA. So the uh, characteristics of how DNA works, um, Darwin didn't know. But anyway, he worked out that the uh, evolution is by natural selection, is through some kind of methods of inheritance, inheritance inheritance and uh, of course we now know that the the inheritance is through dna and we also now know that there's there's more than one form of the, this uh, genetic methods there's another one called rna but anyway uh, for most living organisms uh, no no not more uh, for the larger living organisms they are usually dna but for the smaller living organisms, they might be DNA. For example, virus. Virus is just a bunch of uh, RNA. Uh, they, it does, doesn't even have the mechanism of reproduction. Virus must enter a cell and use the cell's method of reproduction in order to reproduce. So life has to be very complex and very varied. So looking back, early Earth is very different from today. At today, uh, today we have uh, not much volcanic activities, but at the early stage, it has more activities. The moon is closer, uh, the temperature is hotter, and of course there, there will be liquid water, both fresh and salted, and uh, not much oxygen, and eventually, uh, through photosynthesis, 
most of the carbon dioxide has uh, co uh, converted into plant material or carbonates, and then uh, we now have oxygen. At early Earth, we also had a lot of methane, ammonia, and so forth. So this is a depiction of it, what it might look like in the early Earth. And of course, the organic material, as we had discussed previously, might also come from um, meteorites. And the genetics, uh, the storage of information and so forth, that was something we will go into a bit more, more details. So maybe we are just doing an over, overview of what we are going to talk about in the next few times. Uh, of course, obviously, we want to eventually focus on us. So uh, we will be tracing our, our evolution path, human's evolution path, rather than whales, for example. Okay, that's it for my presentation. And stop sharing, and then we can discuss. Any questions? Ah, the question of why during wartime we have more males than female. It might be the fun, uh, uh, hormone stress on the female, and that hormone stress uh, changes the biology. And therefore, it will produce more, more male. Probably that will be one of the reasons. And therefore, when, when there's more stress, and um, reproduction, female, uh, human reproduction is, is uh, very interesting in another way. We are born very premature. We are, we, when we are born, uh, we almost know nothing. And uh, a baby, a human baby, has the maximum head size. So um, the head is almost larger than the body. <laughs> yes. Yeah, because uh, humans put our effort into our brain. Our, our whole growth is about our brain. Body is just the supporting part. So... And uh, we will talk into look into that a bit later on, especially uh, why this our brain is so large and the brain is very en energy intensive. Uh, when resting, about twenty five percent of our body energy is used by the brain, which represents about two to five percent of our body weight. So it is a very hungry organ. So we will have to find out why a human during our past is able to evolve with such a large brain. So that, there's a lot of interesting things we will talk about in the future about us. Okay, any, any question? Uh, a comment. I've had the honour of going to the Galapagos Islands and it's amazing there to see the animals, how tame they are and the similarities differences yeah quite remarkable yeah i think the that is the region where uh, darwin get his, yes. get his in, yes. inspiration yes. yes and the islands are different to one another even though they're close together there's different ah. whatevers and they show there how some of the species might have come from say uh south america and floated over on Debris after a storm, like a branch, branches of a tree, and uh, and they've landed. They've got stopped by the by the islands. Yeah. Well, Australia is the same. Uh, we are a very mm. old continent, so we the animals and the and the and the plants on 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 Australia is quite different from mm. anywhere else. For example, we have kangaroo. Is, which is almost unique around the world. Mm. And we have also emus. <laughs> yeah. so, so that suggests... And platypus. Uh, Sorry? Yeah. And platypus, platypus yeah. is also unique. Yeah. So, Albert, that suggests that at some stage there were, um, when animals spread around the world at a stage of development, then got isolated and they 
same animal on different land masses has gone in different directions because of a food sources, climate, the whole range of things. Yeah. Predators, uh, protecting themselves, etc. Yeah. Mm. So actually when we look at big history this way, it's interesting to, to look at in this long train, at this ma major trend is quite fascinating. And of course there are many details in between, but the the story now is coming out very clear is that we we, we know the approximate uh, history of us, which is not possible say three hundred years ago. Mm. So we are living in a very fascinating time in terms of knowledge. Mm. Any other question? About, yep. Can I have for this uh, review? So this is a Darwin uh, question for me. Sorry? Repeat again? Can I have, can I have uh, this uh, video for me? Oh, yeah. I, I can send it over to you. Uh, yes. I will put the link onto the email and then send it out for everybody. All right, thank oh, you. Good, thank you, Albert. And uh, evaluation, uh, evolution. Yep. I think it's, uh, about uh, a week ago, I seen one of uh, someone who in Australia, someone who, who go to the small island, and that island is at the very top, almost uh, at about the clouds area. And over there, you have uh, some birds. And that bird is supposed to have a, some, can have a wind, can fly. And, uh, and now so the wind is uh, too small. So they cannot fly and still on the, on the top. Because they don't need they, to fly they, anymore. Uh, people are very difficult to climb up to, on that, uh, that location. Yeah, just like Himalayas. Up, up in the Himalayas, we will find uh, fossils of clams, fish, and so forth. Because okay. of, yeah, yeah, I know There's a, that one is because uh, the, uh, the the land itself yep. used to be from from, from the, the from sea. ocean and then <clears throat> yeah. push it push it up. So. Yeah. But this one, I see. I watch it on the TV, and still the people just are climbing up over there, but it's not very high, uh, but it's very sharp, very sharp, and then it can going up. And the birds used to be over there. Yeah, and uh, for for a few hundred years, but now the birds is uh, just about this side. <laughs> yeah, and there's no wind at all. <laughs> it's just like a 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 hen or or, chick, or chicken. Yeah, it's very cute. Yeah, again, evolution. You you don't you don't need it, then you you don't want to waste energy in it, yeah. and so it strengths. Nature is very Albert. efficient. Yes, Albert? Albert, uh, um, I don't know whether you heard the news this morning um, that um, in nearly 200 years of keeping um, temperature records, uh, Siberia had its warmest June day ever, um, much higher than um, ever before. And one has to wonder how this is going to affect evolution. I mean, we we know we are in a period of global warming, but that's a frightening statistic, actually. Well, evolution takes time. So if the warming uh, is warming too fast, then we can't adopt, adapt in time. And therefore, there will be a lot of uh, um, species dying because species can, oh, cannot yes. adapt in time to catch up with the warming and Absolutely. then that is another another extinction um, uh, another um, massive extinction in 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 our earth history there has been many many mass extinctions anyway so the only problem is we don't want the extinction to include human species that's it <laughs> yeah but what we're talking about is um Human inspired extinctions. Yeah. That, um, uh, that's the I, I won't part. call it inspired. I, want, I would like call it triggered. It's triggered by us. Yeah. 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 That's a better word. Yeah. yeah. 
we we oh, really don't want to 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 have uh warming, but yeah. we are doing. Oh. Yep. I'm not condoning anything, but if you over the world's history, if all the pandemics and volcanoes and natural disasters didn't happen, if wars didn't happen, we'd we'd be fighting for food now. We'd have to fight to to get something to eat. We we just wouldn't cope on a on the bigger world stage. Well, the the. There is a, a interesting topic about collapse, society collapse. Uh, a, a, for example, a city, uh, it will, because of its uh, geography, usually geography, it becomes uh, growing, becomes an attraction to many people and it becomes a city. But as mm. a city, that means it cannot produce sufficient um, resources for itself. You have to depend on the surrounding areas. So as the cost of moving material into the city uh, becomes higher and higher, eventually the population of the city cannot sustain, and then you will see a collapse. So that's one, mm. one kind of collapse. The other mm. kind of collapse is, of course, due to natural disasters like pandemics or earthquakes or volcanoes or weather, etc. <coughs> Uh, but with global warming, we were expecting the natural disasters to occur more frequent. That's for sure. Yeah. And the, cur the current uh, pandemic has already killed over 40, 400,000 people. Yeah. If we look at, um, not science fiction, but um, make-believe, we've had a film about 10 years plus ago Kevin Costner and Waterworld, where there was only water, and if you had some earth in your hand, that was like we treat gold. Yeah. I wow. mean, it's all make believe, but it's, it's interesting how they can think these things up and well, at the, that stage they're not true, but they could become towards the true side of the dial. Yeah, because the, the as, we, as the uh, earth get warm, there's... The, the the water lock up on the two poles will become liquid, and it oh, will increase the the uh, sea level. So Sorry. we are seeing sea level rises these days anyway. So we just hope that the sea, just we just we were most of the big cities, Sydney, Melbourne, New York, Shanghai, all those big cities usually by the coast. Yeah. Oh yes. And so when the when the sea level rises, this city might be um, emerged. So mm -hmm. the infrastructure have to change, and changing the infrastructure there is very very expensive. You want mm -hmm. still want to keep the city. So there's mm -hmm. a a whole number of questions coming from there. Albert, you mentioned um, the number of people who had died of um, COVID nineteen. Yeah. Uh, I think my statistics are correct. That is more people who died in the Second World War, the Korean War, and the Vietnamese War put together. Uh, the uh, the it, number of it just deaths tells you how many people have died, died from war virus. rather than natural disasters. Yes. Yeah. 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 We we humans as a, is is able to kill. We are very efficient killer. <coughs> okay, uh, anyway. Another angle, no, another no, angle, I'm, but... I'm saying the opposite. I'm saying that COVID-19 has killed more people no. than in the three wars. I, but I have seen those statistics. Okay, we'll, no? we'll talk to that a bit later on. <laughs> Yeah, now, with check, another check another me. angle, as we get uh, more population and short of um, things we like, we like to have good, clean rainwater to drink. But if we said to people in Melbourne, you're all going to drink, turn on your tap and you'll have recycled sewage coming out of it, which will be quite clean and okay to drink. We'd all turn our noses up. But in nature, the water we drink as clean rainwater has gone through life forms way in the past, either human, non-human, but going way in the past, 
So we're already doing that, but yeah. we don't know the difference. Yeah. It is clean, it is healthy for you, and we're okay with it because it keeps us going. Yeah. yeah. Nature is a great recycler. Mm. Okay, uh, I better finish this one and then start the next one. Okay. All right. I'll see you in five minutes. I'll get something to eat. Thanks. Yeah, we will see you each other. Good, yeah. good, right. good, good to see you back. See you. Yeah. Okay, yeah. bye. See you then. Take care. Bye. 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 See you on the other side.